after listening to Chris's talk, I should choose my words carefully. Uh, every slide has sarcopenia on it, but anyway, uh, I recently moved to Georgia Tech. It's been two weeks now, but most of the data I'm going to present today is done at Harvard in Amy Wages' lab. And yes, Young is my real name, and it's a cool name to have when you're studying aging. <laughs> So yeah, we use same slides. So uh, she did a wonderful introduction on sarcopenia, so I'm just gonna be a quick brief on this. But one thing I wanna point out about uh, skeletal muscle is that plasticity. Uh, what I mean by that is that skeletal muscle has a robust ability to adapt to the external environment. And for example, when you engage in a resistant exercise like this person here, the muscle respond by getting bigger, uh, breaking down and rebuilding it to, uh, to adapt to the stressor outside. And conversely, if you're going to microgravity, or you lose innovation, or you go on a starvation for a long time, or long-term bed rest, you can lose up to 50% of your muscle mass in seven days. And this phenomenon is called muscle wasting. But the good thing about skeletal muscle is that even if you lose 50% of your muscle mass, you could grow it back. If you exercise, you could grow back to the muscle, back to this, the normal state, and even make it you know, grow bigger. But the problem with aging is that it only goes to one direction. And once you lose the muscle mass, it's really hard to regain the muscle mass back. And yeah, this is the blah, blah slide she was referring to. The, so sarcopenia, this phenomenon of age-related muscle loss and function is, de is defined as a sarcopenia. And her as we age, the it increase in population of aged individual, the healthcare cost is in gonna increase to treat sarcopenia. And like she said, it occurs to everybody it start, you know, even the best one of us. So Terminator here, and 007 James Bond, Dirty Harry, you name it. So it occurs to everybody, and there are many hypotheses to describe sarcopenia, the to cause of sarcopenia, to describe the phenomenon of sarcopenia. But main thing we want to focus in our lab was to to study the muscle stem cell dysfunction with age and how it leads to the uh, dysfunctional uh, regeneration after injury. And the muscle has a resident stem cell called satellite cell. Anatomically, it's located right along the muscle fiber and under, underneath the basal lamina, as you can see from this picture. And normally, they are quiescence. But when there's a cue to regenerate, uh, they, undergo, they enter the cell cycle, they proliferate, and they differentiate into myotube and eventually fuse with the existing fiber to add the nuclei or add a cytosolic, cytosolic volume to the existing muscle. And when we exercise, the muscle gets bigger. And satellite cell also plays a role in adding more myonuclei to the existing muscle. And we, in, our, in Amy Wages' lab, we use a fact sorting to isolate the pure popula population of satellite cell. In the previous studies, when we isolate the myogenic cells, you have a mixture of hematopoietic and adipogenic fibrogenic uh, type. But using a combination of sur surface marker, you could isolate the pure population of the satellite cell. And we could, you could uh, study them in vitro, and we could also transp transplant them in vivo as well. But with age, there's a significant decrease in number of a muscle stem cell. As you can see from this uh, graph here, at young age, you maintain about 12% of the uh, total life cells. But as we age, there's a significant decline in the total number of uh, satellite cells. And not only that, the ability to, uh, gen ability to build the myotube that are, that are essential for fusing with the existing fiber, is it similar to the number of satellite cells, there's also a decrease in their formation of the myotube as, as we age. And <clears throat> as a result, uh, when there is an injury, so if you, if you injure the, you know, artificially injure the muscle on, uh, on the periphery with the dry ice or the chemical injury with the cardiotoxin, and if you section the muscle, and if you look at the cross-section area of the muscle, the injured area in the young animal uh, regenerate robustly uh, after seven days. And this is a picture of the regenerating muscle uh, marked by the centralized nuclei. But if you compare the young muscle with the old muscle, as you can see in the periphery, there there aren't many uh, cells that are regenerating in the old muscles, and the, 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 instead of making a muscle fiber, the, it, the fiber is replaced by a fibrotic area, and there are not a lot of uh, necrotic uh, fibers as well. And there are also a lot of uh, immune cells infiltrating at the same time point. 
So what are the causes of this decline uh, in regeneration with age? And we wanted to test this in a, in a just like any other stem cell, we want to test the intrinsic properties or the, the, the niche or the microenvironment or the systematic factors that are uh, playing a role in the regeneration. And we use a surgical technique called parabiosis. And this technique, uh, it, my advisor, Amy Wagers, has been using it to study the hematopoietic stem cell. But about 10 years ago, she teamed up with the Tom Randall's lab and Irina Convoy in, in Tom Randall's lab and published a paper pioneering people uh, showing that if you expose the old animal to the young systematic environment, the old stem cell can still function and uh, increase the regenerative, poten regenerative potential. But the question was, it's been nearly 10 years, but we weren't able to find the youthful factor. I mean, we, they were able to find a uh, couple of negative factors, including CCL11 and the wind, but finding that positive youthful rejuvenating factor was really uh, uh, difficult to find. And Amy collaborated with just about anybody on parabiosis. And recently, she collaborated with the Rich Lee at Harvard University. And we found that, that if you do a parabiosis and compare the cardiac hypertrophy that occurs in aging, so if you look at this image here, if you compare the young and old, there's a significant increase in uh, the left ventricle size with age. And if you, put the young, if you pair the young animals together, they're similar to just the individual young animal. But if you pair the old animals together, there's a significant increase in the left ventricle size. But interesting, if you put the young animals with the old animals, the, the cardiac hypertrophy is significantly decreased, just like the young animal. So we use a proteomics approach. And instead of using the regular proteomics approach, uh, we use the company called Somalogic, and which is we use the aptomer-based approach to uh, detect the proteins more sens uh, has more sensitivity in detecting proteins in the serum. And we found 13 factors that are uh, express, uh, in, expressed by the heterochronic parabiosis. And we decided to focus on a protein called GD, uh, GDF11, growth differential factor 11, or BMP11. The reason we did uh, focus on this protein is that we found that, uh, that with age, there's a significant decline in GDF11 level in the serum. And when we put the animals together, uh, either young isochronic or old isochronic, there's a, similarly there's a significant decrease. But if you put the young animal and old animal together, the levels of, a uh, levels of GDF11 is restored. And so in order to mimic parabiosis, we took the recombinant protein at 0.1 milligram per kg and injected into either young animal or the old animal. Uh, we use 57 black six mice. And we treat them for four weeks and see if they can mimic the parabi heterochronic parabiosis. And, and indeed, if you put the, young, if you put the an old animals in the GDF11, uh, GDF11 treatment for four weeks, there was a significant decrease in the, the heart weight and as well as the, the cardiomyocyte cross-sectional area, suggesting that just by replacing the GDF11, we were able to mimic the parabiosis effect. And not only it does it decrease the, the GDF11 level decrease in the serum or the plasma, it, only, it also decreases in the skeletal muscle as well. So we want to test whether recombinant GDF11 can restore the muscle mass in the, in the skeletal, in, 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 have a similar effect in the skeletal muscle as well. So we took the same regimen, uh, 0.1 milligram per kg for four weeks into a young animal and the old animal. As you can see from this graph, in the young animal, we did not see any difference in the, in, in the frequency of the muscle stem cell in the young. But if you treat them into the old animal, there's a significant decrease with the age, but treating with the GDF11 was, was able to restore the number of satellite cells in the muscle. And also, their ability to make myotube in vitro declines with age, but if you treat them with the GDF11, uh, there was a, you know, it was re restored. And not only that, this, this increase in the myogenic, myogenic potential and also increase in the, the stem cell number at the, if you treat, do the same injury uh, essay that we did, uh, I showed in the previous slide, in the young animals, uh, even if you treat it with the GDF, GDF11, there's a no difference in uh, size of the, uh, the regenerating fiber. But if you treat the old animals with the GDF11, as you can see from this graph, in the young animal, there are a lot more smaller fibers, but the muscles that are treated with the GDF11, the cross-section area of the size is getting bigger. And we wanted to test it in a different way, and we 
isolate the, the satellite cell from the GFP positive, GFP, uh, beta actin GFP mice, so all the cells are GFP positive, and we inject it into either vehicle uh, treated or the GDF11 treated animal. And as you can see from the, uh, the graph here, and if you treat them with the GDF11, there's a lot more GFP positive fibers in, in the muscle, uh, and this is just a quantification. Suggesting that if you treat it with the GDF11, the satellite cells are more readily engrafting into the e existing fibers. And not only that, th not only they have a more engraftment, if you look at the individual uh, fiber that are uh, transplanted, and as you can see, comparing the vehicle con uh, treated and the GDF-11, the cross-section and area is significantly increased in the GDF-11 treated. And the force generation is directly proportional to the, the cross-section and area, suggesting that this might have an increase in strength. And the skeletal muscle, 80% uh, of the cell volume in the skeletal muscle is protein. So since we saw an increase in the cross-section area, we wanted to see whether there's an increase in protein synthesis by GDF11 treatment. And there are, uh, most of the TGF beta family, uh, when they're bound to the, the receptors, they could either go to the kinetical pathway, kinetical pathway through the uh, SMAT pathway, or they could also go into the non-kinetical pathway uh, uh, through PI3 kinase or AKT. So we want to test whether uh, treatment with GDF11 is increasing the protein synthesis through the non-kinetical pathway through AKT. And what we found is that uh, uh, the S6 kinase, with S6, phosphorylation of the S6, which is uh, downstream of mTOR, was significantly increased both in the, both in the, the regenerating, air, uh, regenerating uh, fibers and as well as a normal, fiber, uh, norm uh, normal physiological state, suggesting that the protein synthesis is also increased by GDF11 treatment. And also, the aging, the, one of the characteristics of aging is that uh, uh, is the uh, is the mitochondrial dysfunction. As you can see from the EM pictures from the young skeletal muscle and the aged skeletal muscle, as you can see, the interfibrillar mitochondria that are located on the Z line here is significantly di disrupted in the old animals. Uh, but it, when you treat it with the GDF11, as you can see in the control animal, you see a lot of uh, fiber degradation and they, there's uh, enlargement of the mitochondria. But treatment of GDF11 significantly decreased the morphological dysfunction of the mitochondria. And this is a high resolution picture. And the PGC1 alpha, which is the mass regulator of uh, mitochondrial biogenesis, is also significantly increased by the GDF11, recombinant GDF11 treatment. And we also test this in in vitro, and when we grow this in a satellite cell and differentiate into myotube, and when we treat them with the GDF11 in vitro, there was a significant increase in the mitochondrial content. And this was also confirmed by the level of the, oxy the rate of the oxygen consumption. Both in the young, uh, there was a trend for uh, increase in the young, but in the old and uh, myotubes, there was a significant increase in the oxygen consumption by GDF11 treatment. And we did make measure some of the functional measurement in the muscle by GDF11. Uh, we looked at the endurance capacity, and we put the animals in the treadmill, just like exactly the same treadmill you see in the fitness center. But we encouraged the animal to run by putting a shocker on the bottom here. So when they <laughs> fall off, they get shocked, and they run. So we, test, uh, we tested whether GDF11 uh, improves the uh, endurance capacity as well. And as you can see from this graph, it's a slight increase, but in the animals that are treated with the GDF11 was able to uh, run much longer. And we confirmed this with the lactate level. So every 20 minutes, we measured the lactate level. So when the animal gets exhausted, the lactate are produced by the muscle, and they go into a circulation and the liver gets convert, converted into pyruvate, and then you know, it's taken up to the muscle like, again. But lactate can also convert into a pyruvate inside the muscle and use it as a fuel source during the aerobic ex exercise. But as you can see from this pic, uh, graph here, the animals that are treated with the GDF11 was, uh, was able to uh, remove lactate much faster than the, the controlled animals, suggesting that they might have an improved mitochondria function and they might have improved ability to convert into pyruvate and use it as a fuel source. And what's interesting is that uh, this is a young animal that are just ran on the treadmill for 50 minutes. If you look in the, if, if you take the serum right after the exercise, uh, there's no difference in the GDF11 level and immediately after exercise, but there's a slight increase at six months, uh, six hours later 
And if you take the serum after 20, 27 hours after exercise, there's a significant increase in the GDF11 level, suggesting that the GDF11 might be released into the circulation in response to the exercise. And we're following up the following up the, this phenomenon in the old era animal as well. And also, another characteristic of the aging uh, sarcopenia is that uh, there is a significant disruption in the neuromuscular junction. If you compare the young neuromuscular junction, the red staining is a motor neuron, and the uh, green staining is a cytochrome receptor. And the cytochrome receptor and the motor neuron is, uh, is overlaid nicely uh, in the normal innervating neuromuscular junction. But in the age, there is significant uh, fragmentation of the uh, postsynaptic side, as well as a retraction and a sprouting in the presynaptic side. And if you focus on this area, there's a significant fragmentation, and there's also thinning of the uh, presynaptic side, causing a in denervation to occur in the muscle. So we did a parabiosis and compared whether the neuromuscular junction was restored. And surprisingly, if you put them in a heterochronic parabiosis state, uh, this neuromuscular junction fragmentation was significantly restored. There's an increase in fragmentation rate uh, with the isochronic pairing, but in the heterochronic parabiosis, it was protected. So we want to see whether GDF11 had a similar effect in the neuromuscular junction. As you can see from the image here, in the control group, there are a lot of significant fragmentation of the neuromuscular junction, especially on the postsynaptic side. But if you give them the GDF11, the, uh, the structure of the neuromuscular junction was better maintained, and this is just area quantified. So that the, if you treat them with the GDF11, there are an uh, increase in surface area of the neuromuscular junction. And this actually lead to an increase in the grip strength uh, when, when you were treated with the GDF11 for four weeks. So in summary, uh, GDF11 supplementation, the GDF11 level grows down with the age, but if you restore the GDF11 level to the young levels, we were able to enhance the regenerative capacity after injury, and you can restore this uh, sarcomeric uh, structure and all the, also uh, mitochondrial function. And we could also maintain the neuromuscular junction and the motor units, and it, it also leads to the mus increase in muscle strength and endurance. And uh, finally, uh, this again, this all of this study was done in Amy Wager's lab and our collaborator, uh, Rich Lee, and Brigham and Women's uh, Hospital, and also the the postdocs uh, in Rich Lee's lab, Francesco, Jim, and also Manisha Sina. Uh, this was a tag team effort with Manisha Sina. And this is our funding source. And I'll take any questions.